Hello and welcome to Promenade Culture Center. This is Culture Corner. We bring you the authentic stories of creative individuals. Today with us, uh, Ms. Claudia Farkash Al-Rashud, author, photojournalist and Kuwait cultural consultant. Claudia, welcome to Culture Corner. Lovely to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. We're really g- glad to have you, uh, especially because we like talking to people who document Kuwait's presence and past, and you have done so much um, in that regard. Now, um, a lot of these stories of how people became what they became actually start in the, their really early childhood. Yes. So we're very curious to learn or whether anything, any path that you took later in life was actually ignited in your childhood. That's such an interesting question. And, you know, looking back on it now, I think that my mother had a lot to do with it because she instilled a love of doing research Mm. in me at a very young age because uh, my father's work took him all over the world. Mm. And as soon as he got a new assignment to another country, uh, she and I would go to the library and we'd check Mm. out all the books about that particular country. And it would be so exciting, you know, to go Mm. home and to just, you know, read about this new place that we were going to and to look at the pictures and to learn as much as as we could about our Mm. new home. And that made it always um, so exciting to go somewhere. And I never felt sad to leave home. Mm. I just felt like, oh, this is a a new adventure. And so looking back, I think that, you know, that really, uh, you know, gave me a love of Mm. research. And traveling with your family, uh, that was so extensive at times. that showed you diversity of the world and of languages and cultures, and uh, that must have helped uh, again your path uh, as a as a journalist. I think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think so because um, I, I always felt like you know there there was so much to to record. Mm. I mean, when I was a child uh, living in Thailand on the Lao Cambodian border, um, I I wasn't uh, recording in words and photographs, but I was recording in watercolors. Oh. And um, I always felt like, you know, this need to somehow re- record these wonderful, strange, different things that I had the, you know, the opportunity to mm. experience. I felt incredibly lucky. How was going to school in those early days when you would be actually moving uh, countries and uh, uh, were you going to different schools? Were you, uh, was that, was this early, very early on before school, this whole traveling uh, adventure with the family or it went on throughout your youth? It it went on throughout Mm. my youth. Actually in in Thailand, I was um, in sixth grade and there was no school because Mm. it was a combat zone and technically Mm. we... You know, the American military couldn't have people there, but my father was a civilian Mm. um, electronics engineer. So I was doing homeschooling, which which was uh, also a nice experience uh, because I could do like three, four days of class in in one day and then, you know, take the rest of the time to go out exploring with uh, my family. And then other places I was going to um, American international schools. Mm. And um, I have to say the only time that was really difficult for me was in my own country when I moved from California to Mm. Kansas in middle school. (laughs) And everyone had, you know, known each other since kindergarten. Mm. It was very... It was a smaller community. It was... Mm. That's the only place I really had culture shock. (laughs) (laughs) Unexpectedly. Mm. Um, I think that sometimes moving schools gets really difficult on children because specifically... uh, different uh, classmates and different uh, uh, groups and little friend groups. Yes. But it ends up with so much richness in experiences that we are not able to see immediately, perhaps. And nowadays True. we are very much against, uh, we don't like going around and moving. We organize our mm-hmm. vacations with children's vacations. But it sounds so lovely to be able to freely, you know, leave something and go with the family and continue either homeschooling or different school somewhere else. Right. Um, Was this easy on your parents as well, taking you and uh, um, your sibling away? Um, Now that I look at it, I just see how incredibly easy my mother made it for Mm. me as a child. I had no worries. Mm. And she was the one that must have had a huge burden Mm. to, you know, sort out the house and to pack everything up. And um, But we did come back to California every other year. Mm -hmm. So I did have some continuity. Yeah. And I would, you know, come back 
Riverside, California, everyone was doing the same old thing. Not much had changed. And I had my old friends. Mm -hmm. So I did have that continuity. And, and, and you were an adaptable child, right? Uh, in all of this. How did you feel mm -hmm. that? Did I, you I, easily adapt? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, thinking again, I, I really have to give my mother a lot of yeah. credit for putting such a positive spin on mm -hmm. everything. She was always optimistic. She was always adventurous. Mm -hmm. uh, we mentioned that you're a photojournalist and that meant something in the past and means right. something potentially quite different today. Yes. Um, when you first started, how did it look? Um, was it very unique? Was it a rare occupation for a person at the time, given that nowadays everyone feels like a photojournalist with a camera in their hands? And what are the differences yeah. that are the biggest in your opinion? Well, that's a great question mm -hmm. too. Um, because, yeah, it, things really have changed. Um, back in the day when I studied photojournalism in, in university, I think one of the main criteria for being a good journalist was to be objective mm. and to do your research and to really, you know, research thoroughly and not to put yourself in the article. And now if you look at the news... Uh, all these journalists are personalities. Mm. It, it's not supposed to be about the journalist. You are supposed to be in the background and what you think doesn't matter. And of mm. course, you know, you say, okay, be objective. I mean, everyone may introduce a, a bit of their own slant, but you really try uh, to present the facts, pro and con, even if you disagree with somebody's mm. position. You, you try to put pro and, and, and con. And now everyone has an opinion. Everyone is an instant expert. Mm. Um, I think it's really scary now that people are um, getting their news from Instagram, from oh, TikTok, yes. from different platforms. Right? Just, yes. And who are these people? I think now, like, uh, I don't envy the young people going into journalism. I was mm -hmm. at... Um, the, the first um, high school journalism conference at mm. one of the British schools in Fahil. And I said to them, you know, you have such a tough job because you really have to see, um, check out which is the fake news, mm. who really is an authority in your subject. You have to check your sources. You have to check people's qualifications, not just, you know, oh my gosh, forward, forward, forward. Mm. And it's an in-depth check that actually has to happen, the, the fact-checking. And uh, yes. one of the things I remember learning at school um, was you have to be well-informed. And yes. at the time, it didn't mean a lot. Of course, we have to be well-informed. But nowadays, yeah. we very well see what well-informed means. Um, responsible, getting informed responsibly. Yes, um, that's a, the key word, I yes. think. Being responsible, yes. Do you remember some of the first stories you've covered as a photojournalist, either amateur or, or an actual right. photojournalist? Right. Well, I was um, writing for the university newspaper. Mm. And at the same time, I was doing an internship with a magazine um, as part of my university work. And then the internship uh, ended and they hired me. Mm. And it was a magazine called Inland Empire magazine. It was for three cities in Southern California. And I became the lifestyles editor, which was great fun. <laughs> Had a blast. I imagine. And sometimes it was just something like, um, you know, the best pizza in the Inland mm. Empire, the a guide to the the spas of the Inland Empire or um, horseback riding in the mm. Indian canyons in the Mojave Desert or, or something like that. But um, sometimes it was more serious. Like I look back on a, an article that I wrote. I was just checking my files yesterday, like mm -hmm. 1978, about the Vietnamese refugees mm. that came with the fall of Saigon in 1975. And thousands of them came to Southern California. And mm. how did they settle? And what kind of um, county and state programs were available for them and what difficulties did they face. So I did do some, you know, serious uh, reporting as well. What topics interested you at the time? Uh, what, what, what did you like writing about? If you had a choice, right. of course. I always loved history mm. and culture. I, I liked roaming around, you know, the old downtown and finding the, the old dilapidated buildings and what was the story behind them. I found an old theater that was falling to bits that had been mm. um, 
the home of some of the great vaudeville acts, mm. even like Harry Houdini um, oh. had had performed there. So kind of like obscure little mm. little known corners, forgotten corners of culture. But that's the, the curiosity you must keep as a photojournalist, I guess, when writing. Well, that's the wonderful thing about the job is that um, I've had the freedom uh, and also with my in my later years working for the Arab Times, I could just say, would you like an article on this or that? And most of the time I got the green light. So anything that I'm interested in, I can go and research and I can go to, you know, meet complete strangers and ask them all kind of questions and find out, you know, lots of Living interesting information. Mm. Mm. Um, did you realize... Um, while writing or while studying, that there are some people who heavily influence what you're doing positively. Uh, did you have role models, mentors uh, at the oh, time? Oh, okay. Mm. Um, well, I say one of my role models was um, the author Tom Wolfe. Mm. And he wrote, um, he, he did sort of this new age um, journalism, like he had books called The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test about the hippie movement, um, Radical Chic and Mau Mauing the Flat Catchers. He was, a, a you know, a, an observer mm. of contemporary culture. And so we um, did it, a unit on him. And then he, he came to the university and we actually got to meet him and, and a select few of us, you know, got, got to interview him. And... Um, He did um, a, a wonderful book called The Right Stuff about the um, astronauts and the, the space program and how mm. the test pilots actually were the pioneers of the space program. Mm. And then in my later years in, in Kuwait, when I was uh, working for the Arab Times, I met one of those astronauts that he had written so extensively about, Charles Conrad, mm. who came here um, to promote a, an airliner, mm. a, an airplane. And no one else knew who he was at the press conference. So I got to um, sit with him for an, an hour on this. Um, the press conference was inside the airplane circling mm. around Kuwait airspace. Mm. And so I was so excited to meet him and, and interview him. And I had this exclusive interview. So, it, you know, it's sort of sometimes things come full circle. Oh, yes. I had, That's just I had, what I wanted yeah. to say. Yes. That's lovely. Um, I know that you have... Um, but please correct me if I'm wrong. You have followed your parents to Kuwait. Right. They were the first ones to come. Yes. Um, on the job, I guess. Right. Yes. Right. Um, at that time, you were just finishing college. Yes, I had just graduated. Mm. And um, how come you decided to come here? Now you're starting, in a way, your own life. Right. right. Uh, and um, opportunities are plenty, I guess. Or paths are different, but you come to Kuwait. How did that happen? Right. Well, I was looking for a job mm -hmm. as a photojournalist. And um, my mother used to cut out articles about Kuwait and send mm -hmm. them to me by snail mail, imagine. And she sent um, this uh, clipping and it said the Arab Times was looking for reporters and mm. photographers. But at the same time, I had been chosen by the University of California to be the Los Angeles Times intern in Washington. Mm. And that was also a great opportunity. So I had to decide, am I going to go to Washington and work for the Los Angeles Times, or am I going to come to Kuwait? And I thought, well, I may get another opportunity to go to Washington, but I don't think I'll ever get another opportunity to, mm. to go to Kuwait. So I chose to go to Kuwait and I'm really happy that I did. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. arrived in 1979. Right. And you immediately, you've already actually started working for Arab Times. I did. At the time, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started um, freelancing for them when I was still in university. And they said, uh, we would like you to interview some Kuwaiti students studying in Southern California. Also, it was the time of the Iranian revolution. They said, um, you know, talk to Iranian mm. students, see how are they managing? They've had their funds cut off. Mm. What's their situation? What are their feelings? So I started freelancing straight away. And uh, you come to Kuwait and you continue You continue this job with, with Arab Times, right? Right. I. You know, I wasn't exactly sure mm. how things were going to go. Was I going to to remain in Kuwait? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to maybe have a little vacation. Mm. But I called them uh, after a few days and they said, where have you been? Get to work. <laughs> and that was it. Did you have an office? How did that, uh, how did those first days look um, 
I've heard some of your right. testimonies at the time. Some of them are very hilarious. Yeah, it I'd was. I'd like I'd like you to please if you if you would be willing to share some of those first experiences at Arab Times. Oh, sure. Well, um, we had I had to bring my own typewriter, mm. and I had this cast iron Olivetti, very heavy typewriter mm. that I had lugged all the way um, from California. I'd done all my university work on it. I brought the typewriter, and. Um, I, when I would arrive there, one of the one of this old gentlemen from the machine shop, he would run out and grab my typewriter and carry it for me because he said if I kept carrying it, I'd end up with one arm longer than the other, you know. And um, the office was very, very basic and the darkroom had no air conditioning. And so you can imagine in the summer, you know, you would just go in there and, and come out hours later just drenched in sweat and, mm-hmm. you know, with a face like a tomato. Uh, and totally chaotic conditions in there. Who were the people working at Arab Times at the time? Who were other journalists or photojournalists? Right. Um, well, I was the only actual photojournalist doing mm. both jobs as a photographer and a journalist. Mm. Um, there was a, a British journalist named Keith Wells who wrote some very funny uh, stories called the Wizard Stories. Some people still remember him. And um, so he had joined a, a little while before I had. And, and so sometimes I would go on assignments with him. Mm-hmm. I would be the photographer and he would be the, the writer. And um, then in the darkroom, it was mainly uh, Egyptian male mm-hmm. photographers who first wanted to do everything for me mm-hmm. because they thought I was some, you know, little girl who didn't know what she was doing. But then when they saw that I knew exactly what I was doing, then, then they were actually quite proud of me. Mm-hmm. And um, I want to go just a little bit back in time. Um, how come you became both a journalist and a photographer? Okay, yeah, good question. It really goes hand in hand mm-hmm. completely. Because um, when I was uh, writing for the university newspaper, and I'd be waiting for one of the photographers to go on assignment with me. Well, they're always late and they don't always know what you want. Mm. They don't always capture what you have in mind. And so it, it's really, you you have to do your own photographs, in my opinion, yeah. because then you can really express, you know, in, in words as well as images, um, the idea that you're trying to get across. And at Arab Times, um, when did the time come um, that you started maybe suggesting topics and covering things that you found and you wanted to to write about? Um, I had that freedom from early on, actually. Um, if I came up with an idea, most of the time they would say, yes, you know, go ahead. Um, I had a basket on my desk and there would be, you know, my assignments would, would be in there. But then I had a, a great deal of flexibility. Mm-hmm. So um, I could really do, you know, pretty much anything that I was interested in. And sometimes I would be sent out on an assignment and um, things were not what we thought they were. Mm. But as long as I came back with something interesting, then then they were pleased. Uh, like once I, I went to um, Jahra and I went with, um, by this time there was a, a young Canadian fellow who I was training. And um, I went to, I wanted to go to the old market there they had uh, a place where they sold all um, old silver Bedouin mm-hmm. jewelry and I, and I had seen it and I said oh I have to go back there so we went back there I couldn't find it couldn't bind it and there were bulldozers everywhere and it mm-hmm. turns out the whole place had been demolished mm-hmm. but at near the market we found some Bedouin tents outside a new housing area mm-hmm. and so we stopped to ask them you know where where was this souk and of course they invited us in tea coffee and we spent the whole day with them mm-hmm. and um, talked to them and did some interviews with them and I took a lot of photographs and a lot of those photographs ended up in uh, one of my books mm-hmm. then later on so as long as I came back to the office with something it was fine. Did you have a language barrier? How did you overcome mm. uh, this barrier at first? Yeah, obviously at first I didn't mm. speak Arabic and that was difficult sometimes. Uh, just for the basic logistics, even as as to try to find my interview location. Mm. I mean, there were, you know, no Google Maps in those days, of course, and um, no signs in English and, uh, you know, trying to ask directions who did have the language barrier and so I would have to leave like you know maybe an hour ahead of time if Mm. I wasn't sure of the destination and just drive around until I found it so um, 
Yeah. I'd, and then I, I started trying to learn the language. But um, first I started learning classical, but then, mm. you know, that was not useful in everyday yeah. life. And then I got a teacher and I said, I just want to learn Kuwaiti Arabic. Mm. And when you compare at that time Kuwait to so many different countries you have visited, because you, you've you mentioned you've lived in Thailand right. with your family. I know that you've also spent time in Sicily mm. with family somewhere, end of high school, beginning of, of college, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Probably there have been other places as well. You've moved within U.S. Uh, right. as well. Right. Um, how was this different? Obviously, you were an adult this time right. Right. and you came to work, but still... Did you ever visit any Arab country before or a, or a Gulf country before coming no, to Kuwait? No, I hadn't. It was completely new then completely to you. Completely new, yeah. What was it like? You know, I just felt comfortable. Mm. And the thing that struck me was how safe Kuwait feels. Mm. I mean, I'd be um, going on assignment and a lot of times I'd have to do like embassy receptions and, you know, then rush back to the office and write my article and develop the film and print the pictures. And I'd finish by maybe midnight and then drive home alone. But I always felt absolutely safe. And of course now, I mean, we have more crime than we did back then, but I still feel really safe mm -hmm. in Kuwait. And that's something that I really love. Um, when you write, when one reads your articles uh, in Arab times, older ones or books that you wrote at the time and so on, um, there is great love for Kuwait that one can sense from your lines. Also, devotion to detail, um, a lot of beautiful topics that no one else, it seems, wanted to cover oh, at the you. time. Uh, I really enjoy reading all of these. Thank you. Um, Kuwait seems to be, um, it seems from your text, an absolutely lovely place to discover and visit. Right. Um, can you share more with us of what was happening in those early 80s when you just arrived? Um, were, mm. I guess, the development, um, architectural development, cultural. Right. Um, right. It was almost 20 years into independence. Right. Um, anything you you find interesting to share would like to hear. Right. Um, well, there was so much going on. It was. Mm. I felt like it was a very vibrant place, and at the same time, it was like like being in a small town mm. and being in a big international city. And I also loved this cosmopolitan mm. feeling, and we we still have this. You know, you get ten people together for. I get together and, and you end up with almost as many nationalities. I think that's still something really wonderful. Uh, but th there was so much going on. And um, we used to have a, a summer festival that was um, put on by the Ministry of Information, a gentleman named Saleh Shahab. And he had like um, the Bolshoi Ballet mm -hmm. and Karakala dance troupe from Lebanon. And, um, and it was all free. And, uh, and we still have a lot of cultural... Uh, events like at Dar al Athar al Islamiyah, if you mm. think of all the, you know, music and lectures, and and these things are still free. It's, so it's easy access. It's not like, um, you know, in other countries where you you have to buy tickets and um, maybe they're sold out. And uh, I mean, we have access to a, a lot of different things, and we have a, I just think, just a very friendly society. Mm. And then you mentioned architecturally. I mm. mean, we had some of the best architects in the world who came here, like Björn Utzen, who uh, designed the Sydney Opera House and he did the Parliament, the Parliament building. building. Mm -hmm. And um, the Pietilas, the um, husband and wife team from Finland, who did the um, Council of Ministers and I think it's the Foreign, of, Foreign Affairs mm. building, right? The, Seif Palace extension next to the Seif Palace. Uh, but or unfortunately, a lot of that building has been changed mm. from the original shape. Uh, but we had, um, yeah, so, so many things developing, but also we lost a lot of the old buildings and Kuwait lost a lot of its heritage and lost a lot of its soul in those years because things were changing so rapidly. Mm. And a lot of, you know, these wonderful old sections of the city who just became victims of the bulldozer. And that was really sad. Um, you decided at some point you will write books as well. Mm. How early on did that come, um, living in Kuwait? Quite early on. Mm. Um, 
Because like I said, you know, before going to a new country, I tried to, you know, mm-hmm. I had the habit of looking for books and I looked for books on Kuwait and really you could only find information about things related to oil. I mean, there wasn't anything mm-hmm. uh, about Kuwait just as a... I wonder when the books uh, uh, with um, Violet Dixon came oh, and okay. her daughter or whether that was... Because I read those, mm-hmm. but I don't remember when they were published. But they are still, it feels like still there's more... There's not enough. Right. Those were published, I mean, many, many years ago. Um, Mm. Yeah, Dame Violet Dixon, 40 years in Kuwait. And her husband, Colonel Harold Dixon, in the early Mm. 1900s, the the Arab of the desert and Kuwait and her neighbors. But I didn't even know Mm. about Mm. Dame Violet Dixon or Mm. or any of that. And so, um, you know, it wasn't something that, you know, we didn't have internet. And Mm. so how could you search for those things? uh, So I was just looking on things, you know, based from going to a library. Why, what the library yeah. offered, yeah. Yeah, and there wasn't anything. Mm. And right away, I just felt that things were changing so quickly. And like I said, you know, things were disappearing. I, I drive to work in the morning and maybe come home in the afternoon and a whole neighborhood had, had of old yeah. traditional houses had been demolished. Mm. And I just thought, oh, I've got to, I've got to write about this. I've got to take pictures. I've got to capture this. Your books are a lovely testimony to Kuwait's uh, past. Did at any point you purposely did this documenting or was it just in a way your wish to write and then this whole documentation came out as a process? And it was purposeful. Mm. It was purposeful. And as far as the, you know, uh, the buildings that were being lost and also the the cultural information, the knowledge. I, I, you know, had the the honor to meet um, people who were like uh, the last of their profession. You know, some something that had been going on for hundreds of years, and then all of a sudden they were, they were the last people, mm. like the last great master shipbuilder, mm. Haji Ali Abdul Rasul, or the last of the actual you know pearl divers and and sea captains. Mm. And, you know, after that, you know, this, these trades used to be passed on through generations. Mm. And then, you know, not anymore. They were working in ministries or, you know, private sector, public sector, whatever. But um, th- that was it. So I felt like if I don't get their stories, um, this information is, is going to disappear. And I used to do a lot of talks when my books first mm. came out and I would go to schools and I would always like tell the students, talk to your relatives, talk to your grandparents, talk mm. to your old aunties and uncles and, you know, get them to tell you the old stories and, and write them down. There's, it's so precious, this information. How does today's journalism look compared to when you started working in Kuwait? Yeah, so different. Like mm. you said before, like now you've got loads of mm. photojournalists and um i've always loved to write in-depth mm. articles i love to just you know go into this different world or this different area of culture and and really immerse myself and now um you know look at uh Instagram or whatever, Mm. you have to just, you know, condense everything. And people don't want to read a lot anymore. Most Mm. people don't. So everything has to be very short and you have to, I mean, your lead has always been important. You've always wanted to grab people's attention instantly Mm. with your first few sentences. Otherwise you lose them. But now um, it's even more, uh, what should I say, just everything is instant. Everything Mm. is condensed everything is uh more superficial yes your work with arab times that continued for a while Mm -hmm. um do you still work do you still write for for news newspapers um how does your your work as a journalist look today okay um i actually haven't written for the uh, newspaper in a while because Mm. i've been busy with animal welfare work and that's been taking a lot of my time Mm -hmm. and I'm also trying to branch out to some different publications like I actually went to um, 
Montreal on, on grandmother duty, watching my mm. grandson while my uh, son and his wife were presenting at a Middle East conference. Mm. And I met um, the publishers of like Saudi Aramco magazine. And I've always loved that magazine. It's a beautiful magazine. And so we chatted. I said, I've always wanted to write for you. And so then they said, yes, we need you to submit some articles, mm. submit some photographs. So that's what I'm working on right now. Mm-hmm. You uh, continue. So this is great news. For yes, us to hear and to see hopefully <laughs> soon. Oh, thank um, you. I I would like us, and we will talk about the um, your, the great work you're doing in uh, terms of in regards to animal welfare in Kuwait. Um, before that, I um, I wanted to ask you um, on how does a writer uh, nowadays announce his books or reminds public of the existence of the books, and how hard is that? Do you still organize uh, meetings with uh, with your readers, with audiences? Do you still have to work hard on, on presenting the books? Um, I remember when I found the way that I could actually buy your books right. directly, not just from a certain selling point. Yeah. Again, I think I, I came to it through Instagram. So you have right. to use the new the new platforms as well. Yes. Um, how does the, the writer's life uh, right. look today? For me, the marketing part mm. is very difficult. Um, number one, I'm not friends with technology. Um, I'm always calling on my two grown-up sons to, mm. you know, come in and rescue me. I try to learn what I can, but um, it's not something that that comes easily, and so um, that that makes it super difficult mm. because you have to, like you said, use your online platforms. Um, so I, I have a friend, a Kuwaiti friend, who's um, always supporting me and, and trying to, um, you know, uh, uh, just give me advice. And, and you know, she's a lot younger than me. And so she was saying, she calls me Um Talal, you know, by my son's name, Um Talal. You have to get yourself out there. You've been working here for so many years mm. and so many people don't even know about you. You have to make yourself visible. So she's the one who pushed me mm. to do an Instagram so, um, so I finally, I started an Instagram, but I'm not as active mm. with it as I should be, but at least I got myself out there on, on Instagram. Yes, the books are there. Yeah. One can order them there yes. and l- look through them and see right. the titles and right. so on. Um, so, uh, given that you made your life in Kuwait, which is beautiful, you found love, you, right. you created a family. <laughs> um, so you were here. Um, and I'm interested in you as a, as a person who documents the 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 moment they live in. You were here when the invasion started. Yes, mm. and yes. you stayed for a while before you mm. before you left. Six uh, weeks. Yeah. Were you doing in that completely horrible, horrific moment of time when you probably can only think of survival and protecting children and family? Um, did the journalists do? also something did you did you right. document anything of the time right. um well number one um i was terrified mm. and um saddam hussein put out this um command you know that um anyone caught hiding a foreigner the penalty was death by hanging and i was staying with my in-laws and remarkably i got a lot of um offers from family and and kuwaiti friends that i could go and stay with them if if you know, I had to flee from one mm. place to another. I mean, that was quite something. Were you, were you um, still American at the time? How, yes. How, how, okay. Yes. Mm. Um, and and obviously, you know, my looks. Um, mm. I I was, you know, I would dress up when they would do this house to house searches. I would dress up mm. with a buy and everything. But but I have blue eyes, so that would have probably given me away. Um, so you know, it it was a very. Uh, you know, risky business, just my mm. being there, just my very presence. So I didn't want to, you know, call attention to myself. And so I put my camera away. I did mm. not, although I was aching I can to, imagine. you mm. know, document what was going on, but I could write mm. and I kept a journal every day. I wrote about everything in detail that, mm. that was happening. And then bef- six weeks later, um, when uh, before I was evacuated and we had to take uh, Iraqi Airways via Baghdad um, to London, um, 
we were told that we would be searched. And I thought, if I'm writing all these, you know, not very good things about the occupation, mm. um, you know, that, that could put me and, and my children in, in danger. So I rewrote all my notes in sort of a code mm. that only I could, could figure out. And then when I got, as soon as I um, got out um, and, and to safety, I started calling news organizations mm. and, you know, uh, giving interviews and, and writing articles myself. So you were very active outside Kuwait in yes. this sort of activism yes. uh, at yes. the time. Yeah, when I got to Los Angeles eventually, I joined the Kuwait American Friendship Council and I was just doing um, interviews everywhere, like for civic groups, for schools, for universities. Um, I was doing talk radio, which was a new thing back then where, mm. where they put you in the hot seat. Their host is very hostile. I, I had no idea about that. And um, television interviews and uh, press interviews and I had to change my name and use a pseudonym mm. because they said um, we'd been advised that you know they could look for mm. my husband who was here who was here and all his family was here I was um, amazed at the bravery of people who actually took an offer so to speak to go to mm. Baghdad and be evacuated right. you literally went right into the wasps uh, yes Um, yeah. I, I read that many people have have left um, this way um, right. and then left the country and went, went back to different countries. But it feels just crazy and brave at the same time. And we really looked at all the options mm. because some people were um, getting um, Bedouins who knew the way through the desert to guide mm. them and doing a caravan of, of uh, four wheel drives mm. and trying to sneak through the border and get yeah. into Saudi Arabia that way. And so, um, you know, my husband and I discussed it and, and he said, that's very risky because sometimes they would get shot at, they would mm. get um, captured, they would get stuck in the sand. Yeah. It, it was August. Um, and so he said, you need to wait until your embassy mm. uh, organizes an evacuation. He said, they, they will for sure. Yeah. So we waited and then, you know, that was the, the proper channel but even then when we got to Baghdad we had to wait for exit permits mm. and um, I was was in line waiting for you know to go through the queue and then all of a sudden they said um, these children you know we were a lot of um, American women with married to Kuwaitis and our children look Kuwaiti mm. and so they said these children are Kuwaiti which makes them Iraqi and they do not um, have the permission to leave So then um, there was all the, the media was there, CNN and all, you know, everyone was there with their cameras. And um, we knew it wasn't the time to, to speak out. But there were embassy officials there and they said, get yourself on camera with your children. They asked the news media to, to film us. Mm. And they said, that way, if you disappear, we have a record of you. Mm. So that was the first that my family in in outside of Kuwait saw that I had left Kuwait, but they only yeah. saw that I was in Baghdad yeah. with my children. They didn't know what else was happening. So uh, Who were small boys at the time. Yeah, two know. and four. And so um, we waited for like five or six hours. Mm. And then finally they started calling the names of people with exit permits. Mm. And they didn't call the whole family together, you know. They called mm. one name and then an hour later they called another name. And then finally we got those, you know, three exit permits and we just ran to the gate Wasn't to the airplane. Wrecking. Yeah, yeah. But what was also really interesting was um, traveling on Iraqi airways And um, when we went from Kuwait to Baghdad, it was considered a domestic flight and it was domestic crew. And they were very unpleasant and mm. shouting at us. And my my boys had fallen asleep and I was trying to carry them and, you mm. know, carry carry my bags. And it was it was very tough. Then when we got on the flight from uh, Baghdad to London, completely different. And they were reading newspapers and I heard them speaking in Arabic and they were very concerned mm -hmm. about the situation. They didn't really know the situation fully. Um, well, the the international mm. crew did oh, okay. because they had access ah, yes, to, to, to news different outside news. of mm. Iraq where, where the obviously the domestic crew, they were just 
listening to the um, you know Saddam Hussein's version yeah. of of the news. So um, then I went and I spoke in Arabic to one of the um, flight attendants, and I asked her if I could like heat up the milk for my son, and mm. then, and she started asking me all these questions, and she said, you know, your children are Kuwaiti, right? And why isn't your husband with you? And I said, well, he's not allowed to travel. He's not given that option. You know, one day they try to leave and they're arrested or they're mm. you know sent back or they're taken away and tortured. Um, and she started asking me all these questions. And then she started um, saying, you know, we've had seven years of, of war with Iran. And, you know, what has our president gotten us into? This is, you know, we don't want war. We don't want this. Mm -hmm. And they were so concerned. And then, um, you know, when I saw them, when I left them in, in London and they, and they had to fly back to Baghdad, you know, I saw their faces and I felt really sorry for them. I come partly from a war-torn region, so I know exactly how it is mm. for people who, in whose name atrocities are are done, yes. and then they are pretty much helpless to do exactly. anything. Yeah. Exactly, it's sad. Um, you came back to Kuwait um, after liberation a few months, some months later, right? And uh, I'm interested was... whether you immediately also started writing and, and documenting right. on 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 a on a ravaged city, on yes. burning oil fields, on yes. a completely changed uh, environment from yeah. what yeah. you've left. Yeah, Kuwait looked so terrible. It mm -hmm. looked so terrible. And like you said, with the burning oil wells mm -hmm. and, um, you know, depending on the wind, the it would be like black uh, mm -hmm. skies at, at, you know, lunchtime. And um so I, yes, I did. I immediately started mm. um, taking photographs and I had been working on two books in the summer of 1990 and mm. I thought I'd have a nice quiet summer and get my books done. Um, and so one of them was, was uh, a, basically a coffee table book about Kuwait and mm. culture and, and history. So then I went back to some of those locations and I did like after mm. pictures. I had the before pictures and I did the after pictures, like Entertainment City where they had... Um, dismantled the rides and right. taken them away, and and um, and the desert. I went to photograph the burning oil wells. I went yes. with the um, KOC it officials. It took forever to to extinguish those uh, yes fires. Mm. However, they they were predicting that it would take years, and it was done in eight months, which mm. was such a yes. such a An relief. Accomplishment, yes. Yeah. Um, I know that in recent years you've been tremendously devoted to animal welfare in Kuwait mm. and I'd like us to, to touch on that topic now. It is a big part of who you are and what you're right. doing. Um, I guess that this love for animals has always existed. Yes. Uh, but at some point you, you find a purpose uh, in it. Would right. you be able to share more, please? Right. Yeah. Thank you for this opportunity to talk about that. Um, well, I, as you've pointed out, I love Kuwait, mm -hmm. but one of the areas in which we are way behind um, is animal welfare mm -hmm. and, and also the environment. Mm -hmm. I have to say that's another one of my passions is, mm -hmm. you know, to write about that and, you know, try to promote people who are, who are doing good things in that field. But animal welfare is um, very much neglected. There, there are a lot of groups that are trying to, to do what they can. And I'm working with uh, Touch of Hope, mm. Kuwait, but uh, we're all overwhelmed and uh, it's just very, very, very difficult because uh, we have no accountability. We People can uh, dump their animals and this isn't just, you know, restricted to any certain nationality. Mm. It's uh, local people, it's foreigners, it's uh, people just get tired of their animals. Um, they get them when they're small and cute. They, they're they mm. not interested anymore. They want to travel, whatever. They throw them on the street and there's no accountability. We don't, we have laws, but they are um, full of loopholes. Mm. They're not, they're not strong at all. Hardly anyone knows about them and they're not enforced. Mm -hmm. So we need to lobby for stronger laws. We need, um, you know, a, an official um, society for the prevention mm -hmm. of cruelty to animals. And um, I'm doing a lot in terms of education. Um, I go to schools, I go to different institutions. I mean, schools, I go from nursery school through university. And the point that we're trying to get across is that cruelty to animals develops into violence against people. This mm. has been documented 
all over the world. And we have cruelty to animals here. And this is like a red flag for our society. Mm. We're, we're still very um, fortunate to have a low crime rate compared to mm. most of the rest of the world. But this is a red flag. We, we need to work on this, um, you know, even if you don't care about animals. But this is something that uh, we need to have a, accountability mm. for. And um, I'm working with a, a wonderful Lebanese lady named Marlene Bogidian, and she's really devoted her entire life. You know, she's sacrificed everything. And she's living, you know, with the animals, and she's she hardly sleeps. She... I mean, she's yes, 24 like seven. There's no other way when you really yeah. want to. Yes, I understand. Um, you are working on forming a society. Yes. Um, yes. That will be able to have, you know, legal ground to lobby, to advocate, to exactly. raise funds, to uh, build shelters and so yes. on. Yes. And this is a job on its own. Yes. Um, yes. But that means that a lot of pe- there is a lot of people out there who are willing to step in to help and to be members of the society. Um, how right. do we how do we reach public? You said that you are that you are doing these lectures mm-hmm. at schools, which is very important to start with young. We do the same with culture, any cultural content, right. really most importantly to attract young people. Um, what else can be done uh, in terms of media? in terms of journalists' right. work. Right. It's your um, field, so I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> right. Mm. Um, well, I think now, I mean, we have to use Instagram, and we do use mm. Instagram. Um, that's how you can uh, reach a lot of people. And it may not be as in-depth of, of a, you know, reporting as we'd like, mm. but um, that is a way to, to reach people. And... Um, Once we become official, mm. then we can, we'll be able to go all out and to yes. really do, um, you know, very high profile work. But right now we're just keeping quiet and working mm. uh, as hard as we can and, uh, you know, going going by the book and just doing Because as much as possible. continuously you take care of animals as well. Yes. I mean, the organizations take care of animals and the numbers are not... Not getting that getting down, just up the number of yeah, it's getting worse. Animals. Mm. It's getting worse, and we're the largest animal shelter in Kuwait. We have hundreds mm. of animals, and mainly dogs and cats, but we also have um, small animals like you know rabbits and hamsters and turtles and geese. Um, but we even have ostriches, mm. horses, sheep, goats. Um, So many of these animals are just discarded. Mm. You know, we, we had a, a very old donkey that he couldn't work anymore and he was just thrown out. And um, one wonders how they yeah. come in. Yeah. Oh, yes. Some of these animals. Yes. So it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it's just a lot of people don't see it, but we see it in industrial areas, mm. out in the desert areas. Um, and you do a lot of things to support the cause. Um, I know that you... All these lectures, uh, right. the, the percentage, actually, all of the book sales goes to yes. Touch of Hope. Yes. Uh, you hold dancing classes. Right. I do weekly line dancing classes every Wednesday. It's, This is where uh, <laughs> old heritage comes in handy. Yes. Well, I actually learned it in Kuwait. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, my, my best pe- teacher was a Kuwaiti, young oh. Kuwaiti woman. She was fabulous. But um, that's something which is a lot of fun. It's mm. good exercise for for the mind and for the body. Mm. And you're so in the moment, you just switch off and you can't take it too seriously. Mm-hmm. So I do that every Wednesday in my basement. If anyone wants to join, they can contact me through email, um, well, through Instagram. Yeah. And we have, I have a lovely group of all different nationalities and ladies from their 20s up to almost 80. Mm. I yeah. think on both uh, um accounts yours claudia rashud if i'm not mistaken claudia yeah, with the underscore, underscore and then Al-Rashoud. and touch of hope yes. people can uh, find information and right. potentially ways to support and help yes uh, join maybe as volunteers but also all of these activities that you organize uh, for the cause including fundraising events uh, again interesting you've had karaoke you've had dancing <laughs> yes We just, uh, you know, I always say to Marlene, we we just kind of pull rabbits out of hats, mm. you know, to keep to keep going, because the expenses are huge, the veterinary oh, yes. expenses, and 
the the rent, the food, the daily food. It's just to it's keep a them lot. keep them alive. Yes. yes. Before actual um, resolutions are brought and, and we can yeah. do something sub- yeah. substantial with the animals. Yes, we do have, you know, programs that mm. we're ready to implement for the yes. future. More education programs, mm. uh, sports programs for the youth. And since there are so many benefits of, you know, the interaction between people and animals and especially children. Mm-hmm. So there's so much that we can do, but we have to get out of uh, survival mode. Yes. So we can move forward. Gloria, this has been wonderful. So many topics to cover and so many things um, to talk about, very little time. But we hope to see you again very soon at Culture Corner. Thank you. Wishing you the best in uh, all endeavors and we'll make sure to report on those. Thank you so much. So nice to be here.